Should I cut it down? Yeah, okay. And you see what I can get. Let's see what you can do. That's that's good. So now we're just gonna kinda cut this into florets. These don't have to be uh, perfect, but roughly we need about five to seven cups. You think you'll just stand there and look cute? I think I'm gonna just eat cheese. <laughs> Cauliflower. <laughs> so it might smell a little bit. That is actually because this is in, a, in the cruciferous vegetable category. It actually has sulfur containing compounds. So it does have a little bit of an odor. Um, but there are lots of benefits to this, and don't worry, it kind of gets covered up when you um, when you mix in some different items. So welcome to my nutrition nerd out portion. This is the part where I just get to nerd out. So, <laughs> uh, so cauliflower is considered a cruciferous vegetable. And the reason it's called a cruciferous vegetable is actually based on their shape. Um, so it's actually four petals in the shape of a crucifer or a cross, hence you know, cruciferous. Um, samples of other crucifers would be things like arugula. Uh, broccoli, bok choy, uh, turnips, radishes, um, cabbage, you know, things of that nature. All right, so cruciferous vegetables, um, they all have kind of a similar vitamin and mineral uh, components. Um, they have varying amounts of each one, but I'm going to specifically say what these are beneficial for, uh, kind of for our main topic. Um, so folate or B9, um, this is incredibly important for our red blood cell formation as well as, well as healthy cell growth, um, maintaining function. Vitamin K, um, lots of different functions, but mostly for blood clotting, uh, bone metabolism, as well as regulating our blood calcium levels. This is also high in uh, vitamin C, potassium, um, selenium, so lots of functions here, um, but it is a trace mineral um, that actually has a lot of antioxidant effects, um, so it actually increases those antioxidant effects. Um, and it's also very rich in phytochemicals, um, and I'll actually talk a lot about the phytochemicals aspect soon, um, but they actually have enzymes um, that actually help protect our cellular DNA from damage, um, and they also have a lot of antioxidant properties as well. <clears throat> All right. um, so cruciferous vegetables, I mentioned that they have very high dietary fiber, um, and they also have those distinctive uh, phytochemical compounds that I mentioned. Um, so these compounds can actually be utilized by our gut bacteria. So lately, there is a lot of talk about gut bacteria. Um, so basically, in our um, human colon, 
microbiota, microorganisms, um, is a very complex microbial community. There are actually a, more than a thousand species that have been identified, so a lot of them have not yet. Um, but any one individual will at least have 160 of those, a thousand plus. So these bacteria in our gut, they actually metabolize down these food components and they use those components for energy. So what we're eating is actually feeding um, this gut, um, gut bacteria. So depending on what we're eating, obviously that will define what our um, environment of our gut microbiota looks like. And then we have the potential to influence the growth, the composition of it. Um, so basically healthy, less healthy, you know, um, different varying functions, things like that. So the healthier the composition of the gut bacteria, um, the healthier the environment. So this can actually be protective against certain disease states. So multiple studies have actually found an inverse relationship between consumption of cruciferous vegetables and cancer risk. So basically, Higher cruciferous vegetables, lower the cancer risk. Um, specifically cancers of the colon, um, of the pancreas, bladder, prostate, lungs, and breast cancers. Glucosinolates, um, those can actually be hydrolyzed or broken down by certain bacteria. Um, and the fiber is actually fermented, you know, down in, in our digestive tract. Um, so it really is the combination. It has to be the fiber as well as that sulfur-containing compound um, really to get that full benefit there. So what is actually happening? The gut bacteria is actually fermenting down the um, dietary fiber. And that is broken down into short chain fatty acids. Why that's even important, um, those actually help suppress the growth of tumor cells. Okay, so that's one component of it. So second component, that glucosinolate, um, once it's actually metabolized and broken down, one of the products is actually um, isothiocinate, which I'm going to call ITC from here on out because that's a mouthful. Um, but basically, that's where you're getting your major anti-carcinogenic properties, is that breakdown of the glucosinolate to that ITC, and that's where you're getting the most beneficial effects. Right. Um, so with cooking, you know, do you get the same benefit from raw versus cooked? So some plants actually have some of those myrocyanases, um, which is basically, um, that's a family of enzymes that are actually protecting it. So instead of a lot of uh, animals being able to scavenge a lot of plants, that's the uh, plant's protective mechanisms. Um, so basically, you know, that can actually be broken down during cooking in some plants. However, with these cruciferous vegetables, um, really we just have to rely on our gut bacteria. So basically, even when they're cooked, these cruciferous vegetables, um, once they're consumed, as long as we're able to have a good environment, um, our guts bacteria are able to utilize that glucosinolate to convert to the ITC, and that way we get those anti-carcinogenic effects. Several feeding studies examining these effects, um, they actually found that both the amount of cruciferous vegetables, as well as our pre-existing um, just gut composition or gut bacteria composition, um, that that really determined our exposure to the bioactive form of ITC. Um, so, and ultimately our, our cancer risk. Um, so one study even found that even just after 14 days of having a higher diet, you know, higher in cruciferous vegetable intake, uh, composed of a very lacking diet that they saw beneficial effects right there. Um, so, hey, two weeks. <laughs> Um, so as, as per usual, you know, um, continuing to eat a lot of these cruciferous vegetables, having them in your diet, um, you tend to receive more of that glucosinolate, that sulfur containing compound, which then helps break down to that ITC um, and basically just decreases your risk over time. Um, so I would say definitely starting young is the best way to do it, but just making it a normal part, you know, having these just included in different ways. Oh, so some side notes. Um, so a lot of our cru crucifers, they do contain a lot of the similar sugar such as beans and that is raffinose, meaning they are high gas forming. Um, so definitely they are harder to digest the more raw they are. They do tend to lessen a little bit when they are cooked. Um, as well as chopping up. So you can actually, you know, actually mechanically break down um, by, hey, chopping, slicing, something like that. Hey, anytime something is more pre-digested, easier it is on your digestive tract. Um, 
little trick, roasting tends to be the best tolerated. Um, but even when you're, you know, doing things like you're cooking, um, allow for more airflow. You know, so a lot of those gas forming particles, anytime um, you're condensing it, like, hey, I'm putting the lid on the whole time during steaming, tend to have a little bit more gas production. So letting the steam off a little bit, you know, try quick, you know, blanching if you're, if you're worried about overcooking. Um, so different methods like that tend to be a little bit better tolerated. Um, and for an unfortunate few people, some people actually can get headaches from those sulfur compounds. So some people really just can't do a lot of these. So they just have to uh, get in just the amount before it becomes intolerable. So, all right, well, I hope you enjoyed this episode and I hope you get some cauliflower in today.